Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Wednesday, 10 January 2024. It is the 190th anniversary of the birth of John Emmerich Edward Dalburn Acton, first Baron Acton, known to posterity as Lord Acton, who was born in Naples on this date in 1834. Acton was very much a man of the 19th century. So he lived through the middle third and the last third of the 19th century. He died in 1902, just as the 20th century was getting underway. And Hugh Trevor Roper, who wrote an introduction to his le lectures on modern history, said of Acton, quote, Acton, by his social and intellectual character, belonged to that unfashionable elite of the 19th century, the aristocratic historical pessimists, an elite which included also such European thinkers as Alexis de Tocqueville and Jakob Burckhardt, unquote. Not everyone sees it like this. J. Rufus Fears, who did a lot of lectures for the teaching company, later the Great Courses, called Acton a liberal and placed him in a tradition with Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. So should we call Acton a liberal pessimist? Bertrand Russell called Plotinus a melancholy optimist, and Will Durant said that the later Beethoven was a pessimist trying to convince himself he's an optimist. So human nature and human condition covers all manner of unlikely admixtures, we could say. And perhaps Acton was one of them. But there are many others who have used pessimist as a label for Acton. Uh, for example, Robert Schuttinger in Lord Acton, historian, historian of Liberty wrote, quote, for Acton, the ideal of an objective historical science was an abdication of the scholar's responsibility. With his pessimistic view of human nature, he wrote that great men are almost always bad men and described history as the disclosure of guilt and shame. It was natural for him to hold that the fear of historical Condemnation, as well as of eternal damnation, must be one of the checks that serve to deter men from giving free rein to their vices. Not only was it morally incumbent upon the historian to disassociate himself from corruption, it was also of great utilitarian importance, unquote. So what we may ask is historical pessimism. So no one calling Acton a pessimist puts him in a lineage with uh, as 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 a successor of Schopenhauer or as a predecessor of Spengler, both of whom are you know, prominent historical pessimists. You could say, uh, Lord, excuse me, Lionel Cochin does compare Acton to Schopenhauer and finds some similarities, but he ultimately um, finds a fundamental difference. So, quote from Cochin: For all that, there still remain a difference in. There still remains a difference in the meaning attributed to the pattern by the two thinkers. This had its origin in their widely differing systems. Schopenhauer's was determinist, atheist, and metaphysically pessimistic. Acton believed in free will, God, and in metaphysical optimism. The system of morality derived from these basic tenets was the source of his distinction from Schopenhauer, unquote. Of course, pessimism is a slippery term, term and it gets thrown around uh, casually a lot. Uh, Gabriel Bonnard de Madley was called an 18th century historical pessimist, but no one compares his work to Acton's, uh, perhaps just because Madley is somewhat obscure in the Anglophone world. One could speculate that Acton's reputation for pessimism is at least in part attributable to his most famous saying, which is power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's from a, a letter to Bishop Mandel Crichton on 5 April, 1887. And if you think about it, always being liable to corruption and being more liable to corruption, the greater one's eminence, it follows that great empires and great movements are going to be led by corrupt men and to a large extent, history is the story of that corruption. And Gibbon famously held a view like this, uh, quote, history is indeed little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of, of mankind, unquote. So in light of this pervasive human corruption and pessimism or attributed pessimism, 
to Acton, how are we to do history? Acton at least gives us uh, an example in his uh, lectures on modern history. This is an edition that was uh, with an introduction by Hugh Trevor Roper, who I have quoted and will quote again. And Trevor Roper said of this book that it was concentrated yet elliptical in style. That is a good description. And it is a really excellent, a truly excellent work on, on modern history. I have often recommended uh, Henri Perrin's uh, History of Europe as one of the greatest histories of, of Europe, but he goes from uh, the, the end of the Roman world through the Reformation and the Renaissance and Acton takes it up with the Reformation and the Renaissance goes forward. And then he has another set of lectures on the, to the he goes forward in this book to uh, the American Revolution. And then he also had a course of lectures on the French Revolution. So a person could read all of Pirenne and then go on to Acton and have a very good summary of Western history from the end of the, the Roman Empire in the West to uh, the French Revolution. Ted Carr, in his What is History, a book that I recommended in my video on getting started in philosophy of history, opens his first page quoting Acton as the editor of the Cambridge Modern History, which was 14 volumes, 12 volumes of the history, one volume of a general index, and one volume of an atlas. So it's a very large collaborative project that we can compare to, for example, Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopedia, the Oxford English Dictionary, and perhaps Neurath's International Encyclopedia of Unified Science. And in his instructions to the author, Acton makes a number of interesting assertions and requests of his uh, of, of those who will contribute to the Cambridge modern, modern history. Uh, Acton died before it was finished. Acton died in 1902. The, the, the 12th volume came out in 1910 and the final atlas came out in 1912. So it wasn't a, it was a decade after he died that it was actually finished. But he, he was one who essentially had the idea and passed it along and was involved in the early editorship of the project. And it, 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 I mentioned that, that uh, Ted Carr talks about this on the first page of his What is History? Because he compares the presuppositions of Acton's editorial directions for the first edition to uh, a, another edition that came out about 50 years later. Uh, the second edition of the Cambridge Modern History, which has some, the, the editor of that had some different presuppositions about how history, what history is, how it should be written, how it can be done as part of the Cambridge Modern History. So here's some quotes from, from Acton's directions for, for the Cambridge Modern History. Quote, it is intended that the narrative shall be such as will serve all readers, that it shall be without notes and without quotations in foreign languages. And then later, our scheme requires that nothing shall reveal the country, the religion, or the party to which the writer belongs. It is essential not only on the ground that impartiality is the character of legitimate history, but because the work is carried on by men acting together for no other object than the increase of accurate knowledge. The disclosure of personal views would lead to such confusion that all unity of design would disappear. And another. Quote, by universal history, I understand that which is distinct from the combined history of all countries, which is not a rope of sand, but is a continued de continuous development and is not a burden on the memory, but an illumination of the soul. It moves in a succession to which the nations are subsidiary. Their story will be told, not for their own sake, but in reference and subordination to a higher series, according to the time and the degree in which they contribute their common fortunes of mankind unquote. And the last quote that I'll make from his instructions, quote, which is about the, the references, the Battle of Waterloo, which was the end of the Napoleonic Wars when uh, Napoleon was defeated, quote, our Waterloo must be one that satisfies French and English, Germans and Dutch alike. 
that no one can tell without examining the list of authors where the Bishop of Oxford laid down the pen and whether Fairbairn or Gasquet, Lieberman or Harrison took it up, unquote. So the project was finished and for many was uh, a great monument of scholarship. Like I said, a, an enormous collaborative e enterprise like the OED. Hugh Trevor Roper says, it seems to many less a monument than a tombstone. A history written like this, you know, is not likely to be as interesting as one written by one individual with a clear plan in mind. But it's clearly the Cambridge Modern History is part of the ongoing professionalization of history that we can trace at least to Leopold von Ranke, if not earlier. And Acton discusses Ranke in his essay, German Schools of History. Ranke appears to me to be a very different character from, from Acton. Part of the power of Ranke's method was his direct rebuke to moralizing history. He wanted to write a history without moralizing judgments, whereas Acton, on the other hand, was the embodiment of moralizing history. He thought it was essential to render judgment on, on history. Ronk has also taken one of the sources of historicism because he wanted to take each period of history on its own terms. And of course, historicism, like pessimism, has many meanings and it gets thrown around in very loose ways at times. But one interesting note here that I'll make is that Ronka in one passage expressed his quote unquote historicism in theological terms. So here is a, a famous line from Ronka that's quoted repeatedly in texts on historiography. Quote, every epoch is immediate to God and its worth is not at all based on what derives from it, but rests in its own experience, in its own self. In this way, the contemplation of history, that is to say, of individual life in history, acquires its own particular attraction, since now every epoch must be seen as something valid in itself and appears highly worthy of consideration, unquote. So some translate what uh, in this passage is given as uh, each every e Every epoch is immediate to God as equidistant from God, but you get the, the same idea pretty much however you translate it. So Ronka explicitly rejected judging the past for moral instruction. However, Acton may have found in Ronka a fellow traveler uh, because of his theological mode of expressing himself in, in this passage. You could say that if all, all epochs are equally present to God, all are subject to the same divine standard. And then we, if, if we are in possession of that absolute standard, then we are in a position to equally judge all epochs. You know, was that Acton's takeaway from Ronka? I don't know. It would be, it's my speculation because he, he, wasn't, he was not sharply critical of Ronka. He treats him, you know, even-handedly, um, somewhat sympathetically, you could say, which is we will see very different from from other historians uh, who saw on a on a who had a scope as large as as Ronka. Given this theological gloss to history that we find a little bit in Ronka and quite pronounced in a quite pronounced form in in Acton, is this a providential conception of history? Well, no one mentions Acton in the same breath with Augustine or Bossuet. Uh, for that matter, they don't mention Ronca in this company either. So as I was saying early, nobody mentions Acton in relationship to Schopenhauer and Spengler as pessimists. Nobody mentions Acton in, Acton in relationship to, to St. Augustine and, and Bossuet as, as, a, as a providential historian, despite his frequent references to religion. Despite the fact that Ronka and Acton seem to overlap in some areas, my take on Ronka is that he has essentially a naturalistic outlook on history, uh, despite his uh, theological way of framing it. But for Acton, naturalism is the enemy. 
And here we can find a perfect example of this in his comments on Henry Thomas Buckle. Henry Thomas Buckle was an 18th century historian who was sometimes called the father of scientific history, who was very pronounced in his naturalistic treatment and wrote a, a history of English civilization along these lines. Acton wrote uh, at least two, maybe three essays on Buckle, and he is pretty brutal in his takedown. So I will read an extended passage from Acton's comment uh, near the end of one of his essays on Buckle. Quote, Mr. Buckle's learning is as false as his theory. The ostentation of his slovenly erudition is but an artifice of ignorance. In his, labor in his laborious endeavor to degrade the history of mankind and of the dealings of God with man to the level of one of the natural sciences, he has stripped of it its philosophical, of its divine, and even its human character and interest. When an able and learned work appears proclaiming new light and increase of knowledge to the world, the first question is not so much whether it was written in the service of religion as whether it contains any elements which may be made to serve religion. A book is not necessarily either dangerous or contemptible because it is inspired by hatred of the church. Theodore of Mopsuestia, Julian of Eclanum, Calvin and Strauss have not been without their usefulness. An able adversary, sincere in his error and skillful in maintaining it, is in the long run a boon to the cause of religion. The greatness of the error is the measure of the triumph of truth. The intellectual armor with which the doctrine of the church is assailed becomes a trophy of her victory. All her battles are defensive, but they all terminate in conquest. It is not, however, on such grounds as those that Mr. Buckle had a claim on our attention. He is neither wise nor himself, nor likely to be the cause of wisdom in others. We could allow, not allow a book to pass without notice into general circulation and popularity, which is written in an impious and degrading spirit, redeemed by no superiority or modesty of learning, by no earnest love of the truth, and by no open dealings with opponents. We may rejoice that the true character of an infidel philosophy has been brought to light by the monstrous and absurd results to which he has led this to which it has led this writer, who has succeeded in extending his, its principles to the history of civilization only at the sacrifice of every quality that makes a history great, unquote. So like I said, that is a rather devastating uh, takedown of, of Buckle, and clearly it expresses Lord Acton's contemptuous attitude toward an, uh, a naturalism in history. So if Acton despised naturalism, as in Buckle, what did he admire? And interestingly enough, uh, Acton admired the Confederacy. There is a fascinating exchange of letters after the Civil War between uh, Acton and Robert E. Lee. Acton wrote to Lee first. Uh, this is a letter from 4 November 1866, which includes the following, quote, the institutions of your republic have not exercised on the old world the salutary and liberating influence which ought to have belonged to them by reason of those defects and abuses of principle which the Confederate Constitution was expressly and wisely calculated to remedy. I believe that the example of that great reform would have blessed all the races of mankind by establishing true freedom purged of the native dangers and disorders of republics. Therefore, I deem that you were fighting the battles of our liberty, our progress, and our civilization. And I mourn for the sake and I mourn for the stake which was lost at Richmond more deeply than I rejoice over that which was saved at Waterloo. Unquote. Robert E. Lee responded to this letter a couple of months later on 15 December 1866. Uh, one, he has an excerpt, quote. The influence of current opinion in Europe upon the current politics of America must always be salutary. And the importance of the questions now at issue in the United States involving not only constitutional freedom and constitutional government in this country, but the progress of universal liberty and civilization invests your proposition with peculiar value and will add to the obligation which every true American must owe to you for your efforts to guide that opinion aright, unquote. For Acton, then, the South was fighting for liberty, progress, and civilization. 
And in that connection, I will mention that one of the things for which Lord Acton is remembered is that he worked much of his life on a big book that never got written. He was going to write a huge book called The History of, of Liberty or The Story of Liberty, something like that. Uh, many people have commented on this. Uh, there was, he has he had an enormous library. He left lots of notes, and many scholars have gone through this. I mentioned earlier J. Rufus Fears particularly focused on this aspect of, of, of uh, Acton's work. So we have to speculate that if Acton had written his big, big book on liberty, it might not have been exactly what we would expect today from a history of liberty. So be that as it may, happy birthday to Lord Acton on this day. And this is also the day on which Caesar crossed the Rubicon with the 13th Legion. And that makes it a momentous day in history. So... Thanks for listening.